Our next speaker is John Lonigan, and John is um, coming to us today as a ex-governor um, of um, Mount Joy. He's, I'm really looking forward to his talk. Um, he's going to give us some tips um, for self-care and uh, looking after ourselves. So really appreciate, John, on behalf of MOI, you coming today. Thank you. Anyway, first of all, thanks very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be invited. And uh, uh, my own background is that I'm, I'm from Tipperary originally. Uh, we are very depressed at the moment. <laughs> so I don't want any slagging from Cork people or Limerick people or any of those people that are superior at the moment. But we are humiliated last Sunday. So, and I went down, which is even worse, and suffered in silence down in, in Thurless. So um, anyway, I'm, and I spent a long time, well, about 42 years in total, in, in the prison system. You know, so that's a, that's a sad life as well. Um, I'm 22 years up the road here in Mount Joy. Um, so most people have heard of Mount Joy. Um, very old prison, still in operation. Um, and I spent a few years in, as governor of Port Leash as well, uh, in a top security prison. Um, and I suppose you could say, what in the name of God would he, would he know about what we are doing? And uh, I, I'm going to answer you honestly, nothing. I know absolutely nothing about what you do. Except, I suppose, that many, many years ago, at a, at a talk, or a, at a meeting in Mount Joy, the chaplain in Mount Joy said, um, was trying to get across to people. He said, you know what? Prisons are all about people. And, of course, for the first time, lots of people in the, at the meeting ever thought about it prison like that at all because it was like it was an institution and I suppose that's my first little message that we can must never forget that we are constantly dealing with people and uh, and they're all individuals and they all deserve respect and I suppose that was one of the only the only things I can say is um, prisons are a depressing old place as you'd imagine I mean you, you it doesn't take a genius to know that you know, the old buildings themselves, by and large, they are depressing old buildings. Certainly the old prisons, the Limerick prison built in 1822, Mount Joy built in 1850. Um, and they were built and designed, really, to be, I suppose, to be depressive and to emphasise the whole thing that is punishment. But they were, they were also a depressing place to live in and to work in. Um, and, and it was about, I suppose, around that and, and trying to make the best of a bad lot and trying to... Uh, um, and one of the things I, I, because this is very important for me, especially people working in the public sector uh, element, um, the one thing I learned after a year or so was that it was a waste of energy giving out about the lack of resources, the lack of facilities, uh, which there was always a lack of resources. The very same as you're dealing day in, day out with the reality that you lack the necessary resources. And... Um, uh, a senior official one time in Mount Joy, uh, when I was saying about the lack of resources, and they were very bad at the time, he said that that's no excuse, the lack of resources. Sort of, you know, it's nearly something a politician would say to you. Um, there's no, that's no excuse for the delays, for instance, at the moment in, in um, emergency and outpatients and all that, or, or accident emergency. So anyway, I, I, learned, I learned, though, of myself that the only thing you could do and that you, was to control the things you control and try to make the best of that. Um, the other thing I want to share with you at the start is that um, uh, I worked for 42 years in the system, in the public system, and, uh, I, and when, since I retired, I've got a bit of a, you know, an opportunity to visit lots of places in the private sector uh, in relation to talking about maybe leadership and, and motivation and things like that. And the one thing I can say for certain is that I was really taken aback with the amount of resources and the emphasis uh, and the status that uh, outside companies and multinational companies uh, 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 allocate to minding and caring for their staff in comparison to what we got in my time. Zero. Absolutely zero in terms of, and that still exists today, I, I, I believe, that we, we don't uh, care for our staff at all. We don't look after them and we don't put resources into minding our staff. Um, and as a, I suppose a result of that, what I'm going to say to you is that that puts the onus on yourself to mind yourself uh, and never apologise for minding yourself uh, and take time to mind yourself as well because if you don't, uh, eventually, eventually it, will, it, will, um, it, it will come home to haunt you really. Um, uh, so, so in my own case, I, one of the first things I learned and I, I, I implemented it pretty much, um, uh, you know, almost 100% and that was to leave the job in Mount Chai every day and don't bring it home with you. 
and I would be saying that to you as well. If, and it's not easy, as you know, but I would be strongly advocating that. It makes a massive difference to just, if you can, say, I'm leaving now and this is it. And don't be thinking of driving home in the car and don't be talking about it at home. Um, because it'll drag you down eventually, because you're all the time. And that's why working from home, for instance, that I have huge problems with it. On, on principle, I have a huge problem with it because of that. The fact that you're never out of the job if the job is at home all the time. You're constantly in the job. And, and psychologically, it's great to just to leave someplace like home in the morning or the evening and go into work and leave work and come home. Uh, there's a psychological break and for me that was that was huge and it certainly because I knew people who who, who fail and were unable to do that and that caused huge huge difficulties anyway I, I, I do a little talk I'm going to do a, a little bit of it um, now uh, a little talk really that, that concentrates on how to be happy now everyone wants to be happy and um, we're funny about happiness as well we're funny about it because I bet if you know somebody that's always happy you start sort of looking at him and saying, oh, what's wrong with him? Uh, isn't it amazing? Sort of, there has to be something wrong with that fella. Because he's always laughing. So, well, the one thing I want to tell you today is that I want to assure you of this. That if you know somebody that's constantly happy, he or she is working very hard at it. It doesn't just happen. You have to work at it. And, um, uh, and, and everyone aspires to be happy. But to be happy, it takes a great effort and a lot, a lot of, of major decisions. Um, so it means, uh, you know, I, I have two little definitions of happiness that I want to share with you. Uh, the first definition is that happiness is the art of never holding in your mind the memory of some unpleasant thing that has passed. Happiness is the art of never holding in your mind the memory of some unpleasant thing that has ha passed. So it's uh, something you have to learn. And it means letting go stuff. And that's huge. That's not easy to do, to let stuff go. So the second little definition is, is e e uh, equally profound. Um, I got it from no less a person than Charles Handy. Some of you have heard of Charles Handy. I actually went to, was a fan of his because um, he, he has written some fantastic books around life and around, you know, he was the chief executive of Shell International at one time, multinational company, come from a county Kildare originally, so he had a huge job, but he wasn't happy in the job because he, he once described his job as chief executive of Shell International, a multinational company, as the equivalent, he said his job and his power and his influence was the equivalent of a flea on an elephant's back. So that puts it into perspective. So he left anyway, he left, and he, he began to write books and, and to give talks around life and getting balance right. So he was down in Clare in Ennis one day, and yet the Irish Times sponsored him. And uh, I said, so because I'm a fan, I'm going to go down on Saturday morning and listen to what he has to say. And John Quinn, a well-known broadcaster at the time, uh, facilitated the, the, the talk, and, and he was fantastic. But towards the end of his little talk in, in Ennis, and there were questions, and this lady put up her hand, and she said, Mr. Handy, you're always writing about happiness, and you're always talking about happiness. Could you tell us what is happiness? And he said, well, I can't tell you what happiness is, but he said, I can tell you, share with you what the Chinese uh, came up with when they studied happiness many, many centuries ago, and they came up with this definition of happiness. They said, happiness is, a, is, a, is, is when you have something in life to live for. And that's, that's, that could be the day job. That could be your family. That could be anything outside your family and your day job. But you can just imagine a person who has nothing to live for. I often think of that when I meet homeless people. I often wonder, I'd say, in the morning when they wake up, six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, what actually goes through their minds? We have a fair idea of what goes through our minds. I have to get up because I have certain things to do. And if you love what you're doing, if you love that day job, or if you love the, the family you have, or if you love, then you can see the difference. That's, so something to, to work for. And he said the second element of happiness that the Chinese came up with was something to dream of. 
you, know, you have the, your day job or the family or the, and then you have something up here. Not the lotto now, not to win the lotto. No. See, I'm serious. I'm telling you now. That'll ruin you completely. <laughs> you could imagine someone from Bansha, where I come from, if they won the lottery, lotto seven or eight years ago, before the recession now. Four or five million. You could imagine going around the place, swaggering. Everyone jealous of them. No, I hate him. Money follows money. Oh, that's what a comment. And then the crash came. And they just saw their money disappear. And not one person would have announced a sympathy for them. <laughs> Too good for them. But well, see, not money. I, I'd say, but something, something to dream for, whatever that is. Travel, maybe. Going to see a relative, maybe a sister or a brother in Australia that you haven't met for 20, 30, 40 years. Saving up for it. And <coughs> saying, getting on that flight and flying out to Australia. You know that feeling? You know that feeling of preparing for something down there, down the road, and then achieving it? There's something fantastic about that. I had that in my life in, in prison, by the way. My dream, um, well, honestly, my first day in Mount Joy, I went to see the women's prison, and built in 1858, and it's a horrible place, and a horrible regime, and 20 misfortunate women uh, in prison at the time. And uh, I had a dream. I said, if I ever do anything worthwhile at all, I hope I'll do something, something to, to make a difference to women in prison. Because I always had a no soft spot for women in prison, honestly. I, I just did, because I don't know what it is, but it just, there's something very, very, very misfortunate and miserable about people locked up in prison, women. I just think it's a miserable... But anyway, I had that dream, and, and eventually, through the support of many, many people, eventually the Doka Centre, the new women's prison, as it's called, but it was built and opened in 1999, and, uh, and ten years on, we gave ten years trying to develop it into what we wanted it to be, a place of care and compassion, humanity. We called it a community, because I came from a place called Bancha, where community was big because of Canon Hayes and Muita Natira. And, and the principle was, you, everyone is equal, everyone works together, it doesn't matter whether you're a prisoner or a, a member of staff or a visitor, you're in the community. And I'm sure in many hospitals the same principle is there, that we're all in this together, uh, as equals, all helping one another. But eventually we had 10 years of, we had a 10 year anniversary and we celebrated by asking Mary McAleese to come in to, um, to honour the, the, the development over 10 years. And that day when I looked into the, 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 the big recreation hall and Mary McAleese was sitting down to lunch with 85 uh, women who were in prison at the time, uh, it was impossible to identify any one of them as a prisoner, a label. Um, it was impossible to identify them from anybody else um, because on that, at that stage they had developed and, and built the confidence that they were able to, to, to socialise, which they weren't able to do at the beginning. Um, and I said that day, looking in, that's it. That's the dream come true. And there is something fantastic about that. A long journey, often hardship involved in it, and then that achievement. And I'm sure many of you are doing that at the moment um, in many different ways, dreaming about someday we'll have the answer to this issue, whatever that issue is. And you're the only people who know exactly that. But uh, Anyway, something to dream for. And it's in that context that I would think that the real happiness is and the fulfilment is. And it's the journey, maybe, more so to achieve the dream than any other part of it. And then, believe it or not, the third element, he said, was to have somebody to love. Not to be loved now, but somebody to love. In other words, to share it with. So if you have something to work for, you have something to dream for, and you have somebody to love, that's happiness. So, the, so letting go, I, I, I've talked a little bit about letting go. Letting go is very difficult, because we don't let go, as you know. We hold old stuff up our heads for years, 20 years on, and you see him passing in the car, and I'm going, faster. Huh? <laughs> 20 years on, falling out of a neighbour over a dog barking. <laughs> and it goes on for 20 years. We find it, but the most important thing of all, though, is to be able to let go ourselves. 
is to be able to forgive, for instance, ourselves, because that's hugely difficult sometimes. And I bet many people here have either participated in this or said it or heard it said, I will never forgive myself for. But you have to. If you want to be happy and if you want, you have to let go. Say sorry and mean it and that's it. And then move on. And sometimes you might even need help to do that. And don't ever be too uh, either, you know, embarrassed or, or, in, or too arrogant or what, to, to seek help to overcome things like that because sometimes we need a facilitator to help us to deal with things like that and to move on letting go forgiving ourselves and then forgiving others hugely difficult so I, I always say when I give this little talk I always give you, you know, whoever is listening I'm going to give them a little job to do see and that job is that you know to, to make up that list of how many people have you haven't been in contact with, who have you fallen out with, that you don't talk to, that you have problems with, grievances with. Make up a list, and then start at the top of that list, and you must take the initiative, and you must make contact with them, preferably phone call. And you're even in t I'm giving you permission now even to tell a little fib at the start. Because I would say to you, take up that phone, make that phone call, and start the conversation by saying, it was all my fault. Honestly, it will make a massive difference. It's unlikely that the person will argue with you and say, no, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> you'll, you'll disarm them. But just imagine the relief of that for you and for them. Because if you don't, you see, you know, you fall out a neighbour, they're going to haunt you. Not purposely, but just by pure accident. You go down to the supermarket on Saturday morning. Jesus, you've just gone around one aisle and there she is. <laughs> With a trolley. So Jesus Christ. I can't go to the checkout while she's around. You go to a wedding, and who's at the wedding? Oh, Jesus Christ. Your day is ruined again. I'll have to stay well away from her. So that's why, that's why letting go is, is huge and forgiving. And being, because it will bring normality back to your life and enjoyment. And reunion is brilliant. Reunion is brilliant. Meeting somebody after five years. Fantastic. So letting go, forgiving, forgiving yourself, forgiving others, major. It makes a huge difference to your, to your state of mind and minding yourself we're talking about today. That's one. Regrets. I will stop regrets. Regrets. We haunt ourselves with regrets. I regret I ever married that fella. <laughs> you did, though. That's the problem. <laughs> I have the worst family in Ireland. Well, should they the only one you have? <laughs> I should have married him. He's a millionaire now. Yeah, but you didn't. Regret, Zach. Like, I should have gone. I should have stayed in America. But you didn't. <laughs> so, don't get rid of them. Get, get rid of them. Blame. Stop blaming yourself. We are difference with blaming ourselves for things that have nothing got to do with us. We take the blame for other people. And that can be a scourge. So we have to stop blaming ourselves for things that have nothing to do with us. And, and there's many other things in that, in that whole area. Jealousy is huge as well. Competition. All these things are, they're, if, you, if you analyze them, say, gosh, competition. I mean, I, when I'm giving a little parenting talk, I'm always talking to mums especially. You know, but competition, comparisons, and jealousy. And they're all in one big. And it starts, honest to God, it starts the day the baby is born. The first question a mum is asked, almost, almost for certain, is, what weight is he? <laughs> now, whose business is this? Up? <laughs> Eight pounds. Jesus, he's small. <laughs> Mine was nine. Oh, Jesus, what's he now? <laughs> and off it goes. And Is he sitting up yet? <laughs> no. Yes, he's very late. <laughs> what 
do you do when you go home? Fist the pillows, stick behind the child's back. I haven't sitting up, you lazy lump. Sit up. <laughs> Amazing. Teeth are next. How many teeth has he? None. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, listen. Competition, comparisons, all, all that has to go. Uh, and that's a very a big, a big uh, step in, honestly, the relief of that. And it can be done. It is, it is, you know. Uh, another little thing I want to say to you is, don't ruin today, you know, by recording yesterday's misery. We have devils for that as well. How are you today? I'm not, I'm great, but, but I was terrible yesterday. I don't want to know about yesterday. <laughs> you know, that's... And avoid whingers. There's, there's millions of them out there. Whingers do awful destruction, honestly. Because they get an energy out of making your life miserable, which is unbelievable. So we just take it that some morning you get up, some morning you get up in, in great humour. And you dress yourself up, and you're, you are actually feeling great. And you get into the car, feeling great, and you arrive in the car park, feeling great. And it's just as you're getting out of the car, hard luck, here he comes. <laughs> Mr. Whinger himself. <laughs> he takes one look at you, and his next comment is, Jesus, you look tired. <laughs> that's, I'm telling you, that's your direct. You're straight into the toilet or the mirror, and you're, oh, Jesus, look at me. Oh, Jesus, look at the lines. Huh? I'm definitely something wrong. And where is he gone to? On to another victim. <laughs> surround yourself. Listen, this is, this is... Surround yourself with people who make you feel good. And avoid those wingers. But surround yourself with people who make you feel good. And will you tell them? Because we never tell them. Will you just tell them? Do you know something? I love going for a, chat, a walk with you. I love having a coffee with you. Do you know something? You'll make my day every day. It may, it'll make a massive difference. But we never say it. So surround yourself with people who make it and tell them and nurture them and be so grateful for them because that brings me on to gratitude. Be grateful for everything you have. As you get older, you say, I am getting down to the stage now where, honestly, small things now make a huge difference and I appreciate small things now that I didn't take any for instance health I never took any notes of my health but I'm very conscious of my health now so I say any morning I get up I say good so that's very basic but it's being grateful for the things that really matter gratitude I'd be saying to you will you consciously consciously focus on gratitude it will definitely enhance your day and enhance your life. Grateful for the things, your, your health, whatever. You have an old banger of a car. It is, doesn't matter. It brings you from A to B. Will you be grateful for it? Because we give a huge amount of doing. And don't self-sabotage, praise. We are devils at that as well. Now, I bet if you think about it, how often in your, in your daily life, on a daily basis, are you praised? Just think about it. I think there's some people here, and you go once, and nobody ever praises you. But whinging and giving out and criticizing and every hour, every minute. <laughs> but then you get, when you, when, you, when you ever get praised, don't self sabotage it. That's a lovely dress. I ain't got that in pennies. <laughs> Your hair is lovely. Well, I actually don't like it. <laughs> You're looking well today. Well, I don't feel it. <laughs> ah, Jesus Christ. <coughs> because human beings, the one thing that you absolutely, absolutely is true is human beings love praise. But we have been indoctrinated in Ireland See, not to, for some mad reason. It is like that old saying that was came up, someone came up with it many, many don donkeys years ago. Self praise is no praise. What age you thought of that? 
I mean, Sarah, well, what age it came up with that? But now you're going to take him up with it. Because I'm assuming to the man. <laughs> but it's been indoctrinated into generation after generation of people. I, that's, that's hugely significant. Self-praise is no praise. So you do something brilliant. Why shouldn't you come out of the hospital or come out of the office or come and, and sit in the car and say, yeah, I did well today. I was brilliant today. Of course you should. Why shouldn't you? So don't self don't self sabotage praise. It's 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 hugely significant. And one of the other great things of, of minding each other is to is to help and support one another as well and encourage one another. That's often underestimated as well, the value of it. Nobody fully understands what you do, only you and your colleagues. Always remember that. Nobody fully understands the job you do, only yourself and your colleagues. Nobody else. Everyone has ideas, and, but they, they don't know because they haven't done it. And therefore, helping one another and supporting one another and encouraging one another is hugely significant. And it will make a huge difference. You see somebody struggling, just say, listen, can I help you? I'll do that for you. you, 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 you it's okay. That person will never forget you. That one gesture will never be forgotten, ever. 20 years' time, people will be saying, I remember the day I was struggling. And only one person came and offered to help me, or even noticed that I was struggling. Little things make a huge difference. A few other little things that I just want to read, we know all these things already, but it's just, you see, this is a funny little story in a way, but it's sad as well, but it's funny as well. Uh, the late Dr. Paul O'Man, he was a research psychologist in the Department of Justice, and he carried out lots of research in Mount Joy during my time. Some of it very, very significant, and very, very uh, uh, influential in relation to the direction, for instance, that, that uh, youth offending and, and youth uh, policy took uh, because of, of the research. But one time, the, uh, when she was Minister for Justice, Nora Owen, asked him to carry out a piece of research in Mount Joy to ascertain the knowledge and education levels of prisoners in relation to drug misuse and the dangers of drugs. So he carried out a very major piece of research and when he was finished he came up to me one day and he came in the door and he said to me, I have good news for you. And I said, yeah, and he said, I've completed the research and I can now tell you, you have the most educated and informed drug users in the country. <laughs> And he was dead right. Because you know sometimes people, you know, it drives me crazy sometimes when, when I read some of these things or someone comes up with this idea, uh, you know, around behavior and around stuff like that. We need more education. I said, it's not, it's not education. They know. We know a lot of things. But the, the big gap between knowing it and doing it. And that's why, um, you know, sometimes our behavior, we, we, we forget and, and we don't do the things that, um, that we should be doing. So, so we know, but to be listened to, just to be listened to. I know, I can tell you, for, in prison, it was the m biggest and most significant thing for prisoners, to be heard, to be heard. Every conversation was interrupted a hundred times, or, are you listening? And I bet in some of your work, I bet that's also a regular feature. Are you listening? And most times, we're not. We're going through the motions. We might be listening, but we are not hearing. And sometimes we need to be heard ourselves. It's tremendous therapy. Somebody just to sit down and say, tell me. And not interrupt you and not come up with solutions or suggestions. Just tell me. I would say probably the most powerful of all therapies to be heard when you need to be heard. And if you have somebody in your life that provides that for you, you are a very, very lucky person. Because lots of people go through life frustrated to death. Nobody, nobody listens. Nobody hears them. So it's, and you too can become that person 
to facilitate the hearing of others. So, life is, I keep saying to people, life ain't fair. Which is not. And you know that better than anybody. Life ain't fair. We have to make the best of it. And one of the things that helps to do that is to accept reality. And I'm finishing on this. Just accepting our own reality, whatever that reality is. Because if you don't accept reality, you're never going to move on. No matter what the reality is, to acknowledge the reality, this is my reality. This is where I'm at at the moment. And once you come to terms with that, and once you acknowledge that, well, then there is a way forward. If you're in denial of your own reality, well, then it's very difficult to move forward at all. And then, so I have the little thing about, about uh, for, for gratitude, that you have the little task for you to go, you know, and you're not to forget this now, because the course is over this evening and you're going to go off home or whatever. <coughs> I want you to remember that you're going to make that contact with that person that you haven't been in contact with for the last six months, two years. You're going to make that phone call. You're going to utter out the words even if they're choking you. It was all my fault anyway. And you're going to change your life and you're going to change the life of others instantly. And if they reject you, by the way, which maybe, maybe there might be the slightest chance of somebody, the one consolation you'll always have is you'll always be able to say, well, I took the initiative. I reached out. I reached out. And then the last little thing. Oh, this is amazing. If this was available in the chemist shop, we'd be queuing up to buy it. And that's the power and the influence and the significance of smiling. Honestly. If everybody here Set down tomorrow morning, smiling. You'll change. You'll change a huge amount of people around you. They'll all be wondering, first of all, what happened? <laughs> Jesus, she's smiling today. Jesus, am I seeing something? I haven't seen that fellow smile for years. <laughs> uh, but seriously, a smile is the most, most powerful connector of every other human mannerism and gesture. What does it convey? It, con it conveys a welcome, an approachability, an acceptance. It's powerfully influential. And it lights up. Just think yourself if you go into a public office somewhere and press the old bell and someone comes in. <laughs> I was wondering, no, we don't have it. Don't you come out the door saying, Jesus Christ, that's the last time I'll go in there again. On the other hand, you go into the old shop for something and within five minutes to half the shop is on your floor around you. You're so welcome and can I help you? And you come out refreshed. It's amazing. Simple things make huge difference to people. So we've lots of little things we can do to make life better and to, to have this happiness and contentment in our life. And if you have something in life to work for, and if that work is a work that you love, well then you have 90% of it. Whatever you're doing, if you love doing it, they say to be a great teacher, you must love students. To be a great shopkeeper, you must love customers, or whatever it is. I met many teachers in my life, and they hated students. Seriously, they actually hated them. But everybody knew as well. And that's the difference, because people catch it and know the person who loves what they're doing. So I want to finish by just paying tribute to you, because again, I say it's very seldom are you praised. 
and I'm going to make a point of saying it because I mean it as well because you're in the caring profession and carers all over the world are known to give, 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 give and never take. They're also known to, to pay very little attention to themselves because of this great vocation of caring for others and giving to others. You make a huge difference to f individuals, to families and to community, not in your life, but every day of your life. You change the world for people every day of your life in the way you connect with them and the way you work with them and the way you care for them. And without you, the world would be a cruel, cruel place. Not just you, but all your colleagues and all the people who work for caring for other human beings. The greatest vocation of all. I call it the service of other human beings. So thank you for doing that. And you just and if you're as I said, if you're able to enjoy it and that you're happy doing it, well then that's the icing on the cake. Thanks a million. Thank you very much, John. Um, excellent talk. Has anyone any questions, <coughs> comments? They're all very shy after lunch. No? Okay, John, thank you very much. Um, So now it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Dermot Duggan. Dermot's from Cork, um, and he's up from the People's Republic, I believe. Um, I hope we got he subtitles he for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, at each at, e at each um, info day and during the course of our, our work over the years, we ask you know what topics um, people would like to hear about at, at our events. So um, diet is always one that comes up repeatedly. So we're delighted to have a dietitian today uh, to talk to us about diet and cancer and myeloma. Thank you, Dermot. Yeah, um, and I will be floating around later because I know I might answer all your questions uh, with this um, uh, presentation, but uh, if you need me for anything, I'll be floating around later so you can come and talk to me. Um, a lot of what John pointed out there, you know, it, it all comes down to this as well, because diet or nutrition is a very emotive subject, you know. We have the science bit, which constantly changes, doesn't it? You know, is coffee good for you? Is coffee bad for you? Should I be eating sugar? Should I not be eating sugar? Um, but I always try to look at nutrition as nourishment for your bodies and our minds and our souls. All right? And we have to eat. We can't walk away from it. We can't stop eating, you know, other things you know, that, you know, like drink or smoking or anything like that, you know, you don't need it to survive. But for nutrition, we need to survive. And there's so much misinformation or it's very confusing out there. And, you know, we as health professionals, we can be as confusing as anybody else. We get into the science of it and you're going, whatever, like, you know, I just want something nice to, to eat tonight. I want to feel good. I want to eat with my family. I don't want to be thinking about all these rules and stuff like that. And that's very important. Always think if you're eating and you're feeling good and you're eating with loved ones, well, that's wellness in itself. And that's the start. There is some evidence-based stuff that I'm going to bring you through, but I'm, I'm mostly going to signpost you to it. Um, and one group in particular that really will, will it's a one-stop shop. If you have any questions about any types of foods or you've read something in the paper or Mr. Google or your local, uh, expert who could be the postman or whatever they said everybody's a, a nutritional expert as well I've noticed I tried to bite my tongue but um, yeah just go to this website because they have continuous update evidence-based information but for a lot of us it's not the evidence it's just what we need to do in our daily lives really um, so yeah where's the evidence and where to find it so we won't have to uh, worry too much about that that's more important what, what's, what am I going to take out of this today what will work for me in my life and any time I'm working with any individual who's going through either a cancer journey, and my other hat is we have obesity disease interventions in, in our hospital, um, and, and, and I work through them their journey as well. It's all about how it fits in with your life right now. And as John says, you know, think about the reality of where we are and where we've come from. And you know, you know a lot of our, our nutritional habits or the way we eat 
was brought through from childhood. I know I used to eat with two forks. This is a pure Irish thing as well, I think. We wolf, don't we? You know, you looked at Mediterraneans. I remember going over to, where was it? It was over in Madrid, and I was out at 8 o'clock, and there was nobody in the square, and I was going, God, there's nobody eating today. And I was under the table after a few pints by about 11, and that's when the families came out, so I ran. <laughs> All right, so look, you know, that, that eating thing, I think it's, it's, it's almost like the famine gene we have or something like that. If we don't get it done, we think it's going to go. And I think as we brought up, remember, we had to clean our plates. That was a big thing. You know, the food is going to be sent over to other countries to feed out starving babies if you don't eat it. I think I said, I said, I said, I send it there one day and that was it. I was, <laughs> I was in big trouble, you know. So there's a lot of these early life experiences that have influences on what we do as adults as well. And we need to be very self-compassionate to ourselves and changing habits. I don't even like the word behavior change. We always use that in the thing. You know, we don't, we can't change eating, you know. We can modify how we manage it. But, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, we have to be very kind to ourselves as well. So whatever place you're at right now, and I know as you're going through your treatment journey, your nutritional requirements can change dramatically. Um, I was speaking to some people earlier, and anybody who's had um, the transplant, the cell, stem cell transplant, there's very specific nutritional requirements that you need both during it and afterwards as well. So you, you, you're... you're um, your nutritional requirements can change dramatically through your treatment cycle as well. Um, anything else we should know? Um, I'll fill you in in a, a few resources that are available out there at the moment and they're really good evidence-based stuff and feel free to um, get on our websites and, and you can get some, I got some books there. Um, these books are, are recent enough, they've come from um, Cork Cancer Research or Cancer Research Cork. Um, in conjunction with uh, University College of Cork and they've done some really good cookbooks and simple recipes and stuff that would be very beneficial for you and you can get hold of them either online, you can look them online or order the, the hard copies as well. Um, and you can always, always ask questions anytime you want and I, as again I'll be floating around afterwards. I always like this slide, um, lifestyle medicine. So we have the, the nutritional health and we have nutrition as a science, right? But we, we have to look at the holistic approach to, to our he mental health or our health and wellness. And there's kind of pillars that we can identify that can really help us to increase our sense of wellness. And that sense of wellness is what we're looking for at the end of the day. You know, eating more fruit and veg or whatever, it's, 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 it means nothing to us unless we feel better from it. All right. So we have nutritional health and they call it healthy eating there, but I just call it balanced diet. Whatever your body needs now or at any point in your journey, that's what we need to give it. Um, physical activity, exercise is medicine, and I know we have a, a physiotherapist after this, but really it's just any activity at all. We mentioned about um, you know, being out in the, in the open, um, getting to the beach, or you know, being in, in nature. All that can make us, give us a sense of vitality um, and a sense of wellness, and fatigue, um, and you know over the COVID we were all locked down and we we're trying to avoid picking up infections and stuff like that. They all have a massive impact in our ability to um, interact with those kind of that, that being, being in nature and being outside. So it's very important that we try to build that into our, our daily lives as well. I'm pure Cork City like I was born and bred. I was actually born in the bands. I'm working there now so I <laughs> haven't gone far from the tree. But, you know, we have a little place in Cork City called The Lock, and it's just a nice little pond. Um, some, some, um, some tourists there recently were looking for the lake. And I goes, I think so. they were from Switzerland as well. And I goes, no, no, this is just a lock. This is a pond, a puddle in the back, in the backyard. Um, but there's birds and there's, there's a little bit of uh, foliage around there and stuff like that. And it's just an oasis in the city centre. So something small like that can really invigorate you, especially after work and things like that. Um, so I would encourage anything that you can do for yourself in that respect is very important. We talked about a little bit about mental wellness and managing stress and mental wellness is very important for us as well. And that thing is a, is a, is a must like anything else. If we don't use it and don't work on it, it can, it, can, it can be our worst enemy. It can be our best friend and our worst enemy. Again, we have to approach all these things with self-compassion. Sometimes when we're trying to, when we come away from these talks or we meet health professionals, we go, we're in twos to do everything in one go. And that's not going to be sustainable either. And it's the same with nutrition. You know, we all live in a grey area where we're going to have good days and bad days. 
or even that those kind of words can, are, are not helpful as well. There'll be days when things will work for us and there'll be days when others, and that's the norm, you know? And I hate diets and I hate the talk of a diet because it just sounds like it's really strict. Um, you know, you get a sheet with stuff on it and we're supposed to eat all of that all the time. It's, it's just not, not practical, really. So be nice and kind to yourselves in that respect. And if you're introducing anything that you're trying to modify or, or change, um, be, you know, if it works twice in the week, that's, that's a victory. And always look at the positives rather than the days that it didn't work so well for you. And that can build your level of what we call self-efficacy, which is your, your trust and your ability in yourself that you can manage these going forward. Um, so these, these guys, if, if you are looking for the, the evidence, and I don't want to dwell too much of it because I know after dinner we are going to fall asleep, right? So don't worry, if you fall asleep I won't be offended. It happens to me all the time, especially when you hear the, the natter of some fell up the top. But um, these are the guys that do all the research. So I know there's so much information out there about well, you should be on this and you shouldn't be taking that, and sugar, ketogenic diets, paleo diets, I just can't keep up with it. There was a there was a juice floating around years ago called No No Juice or No Knee Juice. Has anybody ever heard of that? It's really gone off the whole thing now, you know. But it was massive, and it was sixty pounds a bottle, and all it was was juice, you know. But it was it was just sold as this Alexa, really, like you know. I had one patient; she would get crates sent in, and she'd have them next to her bedside, you know. She couldn't eat, but she could drink the juice, you know. <laughs> Um, and nutrition is very important going through treatment. You have to keep yourself strong and vital going through treatment because that will help with the toxicities of the treatment as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that going forward. So the, the reports really, there was a 2007 report, and I think that the reason I put on this is the shift in the emphasis because we'll always hear about different single foods or single nutrients. You know, vitamin C is a brilliant antioxidant. If I take loads of vitamin C, I'm going to get a load of protection. And we're moving away from that now, and what we're really concentrating on is a dietary pattern, or what, you know, the diet as a whole. And it's this synergetic effect. If we have all the bits in, in the diet, then that will really help us going forward. And we've all heard of probably the Mediterranean diet and, and the benefits that that can bring you. And it's not about calorie restriction or it's not about cutting things out and putting things in. It's about looking at your diet as a whole. And any way we can improve that, we're going to feel better. And we're going to be better as well, because if we feel better, we'll be better. Um, so we're looking really at dietary patterns rather than specific foods. Um, I always get this in talks as well. There'll always be something new coming up and you just can't keep up with it. But there was one in particular, it was the uh, Himalayan pink salt. And I was going like, you know, you just can't keep up with all the things. So pull back from, if you hear of any superfood or any food that's evil, just take it with a, sorry about the pun now, a pinch of salt, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Step back and look at the diet as a whole. You know, and you know, turnips and cabbages are, can be classed as superfoods. And we now know, there's guys down in UCC in Cork, he's a, he works with the, um, with the gut bacteria, the microbiome, and he's looking at things like, and he's showing that actually stuff that's been in our diet for years, you know, that's native to our grandfathers and great-grandfathers, can really improve your gut flora. So something like eating goji berries, which is high in vitamin C or antioxidant, it, you know, your body's gut flora mightn't recognise that as much as it would do with the humble turnip. So whatever your ancestors ate is good enough for me as well, I think, you know, going forward. And keep your foods whole. We're always talking about functional foods like probiotics or low-fat stuff. And, you know, the, once humans get, once man gets hold of food and manipulates it, it's not as good for us, all right? So anything that comes that's less processed is going to be better for you. Um, even cheese, you know, there's good properties to cheese. It's a fermented food. It's good for your gut, gut flora. Um, uh, whole foods, you know, um, very good for us. So be careful of what's seen as healthy out there. Anything that's processed, it ain't going to be that healthy for us. Um, so these are the recommendations. Some of them are very... Oh, I've gone one up. All right, so this is what the, these guys came on for... To, to make um, our diet or what's, what's going to be good for us for cancer prevention and reprevention. And I guess if we're eating well through cancer, these are kind of the, the guidelines that they give us. Be a healthy weight, ridiculously aspirational for a lot of us, all right? So what does, what does weight mean? Weight means nothing, actually. It's what, it's what our body is composed of. And body composition is very important, especially our body fat and our distribution of body fat. 
And if we have a lot of fat, and it's mostly, unfortunately, the males that can get this more than the females, we have a lot of body fat that might be um, in and around our organs. And we call that visceral or etopic fat, and that can cause a lot of problems in, in, as we go on in life. So rather than worrying about weight loss per se or being an ideal weight, we want to reduce that excess body fat that's in and around our organs. And there's ways around it, and it doesn't mean that we have to lose a huge amount of weight to get the benefits from it. All right, so we need to be realistic, because I, I can guarantee you obesity is a disease. All right, so if, if we've been fighting with our weights all our lives, there's a lot of metabolic dysregulation, how we were born, how we came out of the womb, or early, early life experience, the genetics, they all impact on what weight, what weight is or excess body fat, which is the end product of this metabolic disease. So if we don't manage the disease, we can't manage the weight. All right? And eating less and exercising more is not the intervention for obesity disease. All right? Now, I always emphasize on good nutritional health, no matter what weight you are because that will make you healthier and, and you'll feel more vital inside as well. And we know that from the Mediterranean diet and stuff, and I know it's more to do with heart disease, but, you know, there's not a restriction on calories. There's just putting good foods into the diet, and that can help manage the disease, which is heart disease and other, other these chronic diseases going forward. Um, so anywhere you can help yourself by reducing the excess body fat in and around the organs can help manage chronic diseases going forward. Be active, all right? Now that's very hard when you have multiple myeloma, when you have low red blood cells, when your breathing is affected, when you've got bone pain, when fatigue kicks in. But anything you can do above what you are in this state now is going to be a benefit for you. So we're not talking about running marathons or anything like that. And as John says, we have to imagine the reality we're in and is there any way we can improve that little bit? And resistance training or putting your muscle under strain can help increase that muscle mass or strengthen the muscle in around the bone, which can help prevent falls and things like that. So there's loads of benefits um, without us having to do the, the, the running the marathons and stuff like that. You know, we're, we're animals as well inside and movement really keeps all your organs working really well as well. So we're going to feel more vital, and actually when we're fatigued, a little bit of exercise can help overcome fatigue. Now it has to be done specially, specialised for you in your particular part of your journey, um, but hopefully as, as you get more access to the health professionals, that personalised um, exercise and nutritional plans will become more available for you. Um, okay, so eat plant foods. We can all know a little bit more about that now do, these days, aren't we? Fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, peas, they all bring something really good to your diet. And I know if you, uh, when I grew up in Cork City, I think our two veg were, was probably tomato, tomato sauce. <laughs> that would have been one of them. And maybe the fruit gums, that was another one we had when we were growing up. All right, everything I ate when I was in the 80s, was, it was white for some reason. Um, white or defa fried. I think I, I think I got defa fried cauliflower one time. Tasty enough. But look, anything, wherever you are, in whatever way you eat, anything you can add to it, and this is not about restriction again, putting stuff into your diet can have massive benefits for your health. All right? So if, look, we're, they're, they're talking about seven portions of fruit and veg these days, you know, which is huge. I think the average in Ireland is about two to three per, per day, you know. So if you're on a one and you go to three, then that's going to have massive effect in your body. All right, and keep building on those things. Not, let's not try to hit the, the nirvana straight away. You're building on where you're at at the moment. Um, we, we talk about plant chemicals or phytochemicals, and they're, they're absolutely brilliant for dampening down inflammation. So if you're going through treatment and you want to recover after treatment, these kind of foods can be really beneficial. Um, very often our treatments can restrict what we eat, so we have to prioritise certain foods, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But generally speaking, if you're eating well, get more plant foods, and don't, don't be afraid of counting portions or whatever, just get them into you. Plenty of colours, the colours of the rainbow really. The more colours you have, the more natural chemicals you have in your body. And we know as well they're prebiotic, or they help the gut bacteria to grow again. And the more we know about the gut bacteria, it's actually a different animal we're carrying around, an animal in us that's genetically different to us, there was a guy, a, a Professor Shanahan in Cork, he said he, he thinks the bacteria are more important than us. We're just like a, a vessel to carry around these fellas. 
all right? But we have to encourage them. It's like farm. We have to encourage them and we have to feed them and we have to keep them well because they will keep us well as well. Um, limit, limit, limit consumption of fast foods and other processed foods. So I think we all know about the sugary, like this world has changed so dramatically over the last hundred years. The availability of high energy, high fat, high sugar, high salt foods is, is huge. Our portion sizes are bigger, we feel hungrier after them. The body can't handle that amount in such a small way. We're being at bombarded with advertising, left, right and centre. If you ever if you were watching TV at night and you just felt the hankering for something that was just on, you're starting to eat already. There's no turning back then, lads, you know? You might as well just go out and enjoy it and don't worry about it. There's nothing worse than restriction. I'm not going to have it. There was a, there was a brilliant um, psychological experiment that was done years ago. It was marshmallows and kids. They probably couldn't get away with it. No, I'm just thinking. But anyway, look, the marshmallows, they were offered the kids marshmallows and they were seeing how the kid would react to them. And some kids were, had this ability to turn away and, or they were going to get two more marshmallows. When they, if, so they were going to get four if they didn't eat them when your man stepped out. So one, you know, some kids were just so determined to just look at the wall. One fella just was like a sadist. He was licking it and <laughs> sniffing it and everything. But the best child of all just had him eaten before your man finished his sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely me. Impulse, you know, it's all there. And when we, look at, when we look at what makes us eat, we can't deny that we, in, in us, we all have these hormones and these drives and these switches to make us eat. And that keeps us alive. And that's why they're there. They can get overridden through the modern world we have and through the excess body fat. Um, but those hormones will never be satisfied if you just restrict all the time. There was a recent study where they looked at full fat meal plan with whole foods and the low fat, less calories, and the per people who are on the low fat lost weight initially, but gained more weight over time because their hunger hormones, that drive for food, was raised about eight to 12 months after they came off their diet. So they were hungrier after their restriction than they would have been if they ate normal foods. So it's a vicious, vicious circle just to talk about restricting all the time. So you have to be very kind to yourself, and the more we know about the information that's coming in, the more we know that dietary restriction and just trying to run it off doesn't work when we have metabolic disease inside of us. Um, limit consumptions of red and processed meats. Processed meats is anything really with the nitrates and the salts and stuff like that. So we just don't want to overdo it. It's not saying no. Um, I think 500 grams of cooked red meat a week is kind of what they, they recommend. Um, which is quite a lot if you spread it out over the days. I always think if you're having meat um, or processed meat, like having you know, bacon and cabbage is synonymous in Ireland. It's not that we're not going to eat it. But if you have a lot of vegetables and plant foods around it, you'll get a, a bit of protection. Now, we're not saying that we can have it every day, but if we can limit it to the amount, enjoy it, not feel guilty about it, well, that's fine as well. Uh, sugar, sugar and sweetened drinks, all these high, high sugar drinks, they're, they're just ruining our kids really, aren't they? You know, when sugar comes in at that amount, you can imagine the, the pancreas which deals with sugar, releases insulin, it just goes into overdrive really. So it's pumping out a load of insulin to try and, you know, it's just, it's just been hit with this metabolic flood really, like, you know. Um, and over time that can lead to weight gain massively. Insulin is a very powerful hormone, if we don't control it. Um, during the day can lead to massive weight gain quite quickly and after a while the pancreas stops working and that's how we develop diabetes or it pumps out too much insulin you know so we need to manage those things as well you can imagine if you were trying to eat the same amount of sugar say from fruit you nearly want to go through 40 or 50 oranges to get what you get in a can of coke like you know so it's just huge Meta you know physiologically we can't do that so those foods can be very damaging to our, our gut and our body. I'm not saying not to have it, and we all like it every now and again. We just need to manage those things. Alcohol, that's really bed bearer and bug bearer. I think with the, with the heart people, they say, oh, the red wine is great. Or, a little bit good for you. The cancer fellas are a little bit more strict on it. All right, look, they've been linked to, to, to certain cancers and stuff like that. So look, oh, it's all everything in moderation in that respect. The supplement thing can be very um, controversial. Don't use supplements to protect yourself from cancer. They, we, before we say there is harmless, you know, and we're talking high dose stuff here now, you know. <coughs> you know, we know that anti-inflammatories, um, what we get from foods, the vitamin C's, and antioxidant, and we always thought more is better, and so we pile in it in a tablet, but the body doesn't like it that way. And it can cause problems, and especially during treatment, 
if we're on high dose vitamins and minerals can interfere with the um, treatments. There was a, a, a research done years ago, and I think when Velcade was, was becoming popular, um, it was uh, green tea extract, so it was like maybe 40 cups of green tea in a, in a pill, and it re reduced the, five minutes, right, God, I'm talking too much. It reduced the effectiveness of the, of the treatment by 50%, which negated the effectiveness of it. All right, so we have to be very careful what we're putting into our bodies. Food, yes, but supplements or chemicals, or they act like chemicals in the body. Um, so there is evidence to, to back it up, and I won't bore you with that. Um, I'm just going to go back one there now. So look, people always go to me, what's a balanced diet? A balanced diet is what your body needs at the time. All right? Fruit and vegetables, plant foods, we need them. They're very important. Carbohydrate-rich foods, we need them. They're very important. All right? Whole grain, less processed, better for you. Milk or protein or calcium-rich foods, you know, for your bone, it's very important. Vitamin D is very important as well, so you need to keep an eye on those, those, that, that, uh, those connections. Protein-rich foods, very important. to Keep your lean body mass strong. All right? So they all have a part to play in it. Even the, 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 the high-energy foods, if we can manage them and they're part of a holistic overview of your diet, then that's important as well, because we do get pleasure from foods. Portions, it's really just a matter of understanding how much at each meal, really. And I always think spreading it out over the day is much better, because the body likes to take it in, in, in variable amounts. Having one big meal later on in the evening, which is kind of traditionally what we do, might be as beneficial for you going forward. Now, that looks very fancy, but it's, the treatment is basically what it is. And I know we have a lot of symptoms through treatment, and I don't want to be personalizing because it could be very different for everybody else, but this is where your health profession come in. This is where the dietitians really come into our own. We can manipulate or personalize your dietary intervention to help you through these things. All right. Again, the books there, there's um, diet and or symptoms and cancer and stuff like that. The Irish Cancer Society do a lot of them as well. And I have a lot of um, websites and referrals that you can get, get to at the end of this. So I'll, I'll give you the, um, the, the slides afterwards. Um, and it is, when it comes to intervention in hospital, it is medical nutritional therapy. It's a therapy like anything else. It's not just diet. And we need to understand that, that we need to preserve our lean body mass. We need to look after your kidneys, your bone health, and it can become very specific. And that's where the dietitian or your health professional can really come in into their own there. A lot of you might have experienced parental nutrition through your treatment, especially with um, your, your transplant. It's very specific, but again, you need your health professional to help you with that. And there are the useful websites. The World Cancer Research Fund, definitely have a look at that. They're a one-stop shop for everything. Um, the Breakthrough Cancer is these nutritional books. Definitely worth having a look at those guys. Um, loads of recipes, really simple stuff. Um, and they're all available on the Breakthrough Can Cancer website. I just put a little bit about complementary ter therapies um, because I know we'd be very interested in what we hear out of there, but build the evidence up. The last one there, see that Memorial Sloan Kettering? You can download the app. And they're brilliant because they're a specific cancer treatment center and they'll tell you that you're looking at this thing and how it can affect your, your, um, your treatment. So evidence-based, be well informed. If you're gonna take anything, talk to your health professionals um, and do the research. That's all I'm saying to you really. So thanks very much guys. Thank you very much Dermot uh, for an excellent talk. Has anyone any questions? Um, there's some re research looking at um, curcumin and how that can help in certain... Yeah, so, look, so we're looking at, we're looking at f individual foods again, you know, and curcumin we know has a lot of um, natural chemicals in it that can help dampen down inflammation. Um, but what, when we look at the overall um, effect on cancer or cancer treatments, we have to be very careful that for some cancer treatments making inflammation is how we kill off the cells. All right? So if we, on the one hand, if we're trying to dampen it down through high dose kermican or turmeric, it's because you can get these tablets now, they're 40 times the dose that you can eat, that might negate the effect of your treatment. Um, you might have less side effects because the treatment is less effective. 
So we have to be very careful what we do. And it was again going back to that felt kid when it shocked me that 50% reduction in the efficiency of the treatment makes it non void, really. Like, you know, if you are taking anything like that, timing of these things can be very important. So it always discussed with the oncologist um, or the hematologist to see when your treatment is at its least effective in the body. We talk about a half life. So the treatment will be, will be given and then it'll start dipping off. And if you are thinking about taking anything, that's the window of opportunity that you can look at. But if you have it when your treatment is at its highest and you're negating the treatment, you can have the exact opposite effect at what you're looking for. There is all these studies and they're small studies and supplementation has a part to, or using foods like this as a part to play. I've, I always tell the guys, if you can add these foods into your diet, in a natural way. Your body is much more, it's just much more synergetic because you've all these other foods that can help block the effect of, or block the working of these things as well. There was a study about folic acid and they gave people loads of folic acid and they found that the people on the high dose folic acid developed cancers sooner than the people on that were the control group because folic acid is a cell promoter and we know for spina bifida it really helps to close off the, 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 the um, in, in pregnancy or pre-pregnancy but you have a dodgy cell in your body and you pump it, but it's essentially a growth hormone or a growth in, in that high dose that can lead to problems. So what we think is going to be really beneficial for us in really, really high doses might have the opposite effect in the body, you know? And there'll all, you'll always be something new coming up, you know, turmeric, um, crucifer vegetables, there'll always be something, but again, you have to think of the diet as a whole. Protein going through your diet is very important. And I know with the kidneys, that can be an issue, but lean protein will help you get through your treatment quicker uh, and less toxic to your body as well. And it's something that we forget about a lot. Sorry, I'm taking your time, stop. So. No. Yeah, and I'll be floating around afterwards if you need to chat for anything. So now we're going to have a little coffee break and some biscuits. Um, so please enjoy, <laughs> as Jeremy has allowed us to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you not listen to anything I said? Right. Everything in moderation. <laughs> 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 Um, so I'll let you chat to him actually uh, for down yeah. there. Let's go in here. So I'm better to introduce him from here, you were saying, anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, we are going to go into we'll get this Zoom link. Is where now? Uh, so what you? That's it there. I think. That's here. Yeah, he's not a 
Um, can you hear me there, uh, Matthew? Can you hear me there, Matthew? Matthew, can you hear me there? Matthew? Matthew, can you you hear me there? Okay, Grant. I'll just introduce you to. Uh, You're introducing Matthew. So, um, Fidelma will just. Hi, Matthew. Uh, Calling you know. Limerick. <laughs> that's the way he's going to come through there. Yeah. So, uh, do I need to do anything then? No. Just, or are you just, lot, if you British? want to ask him a question, then that's that's the way it'll come through there, you know. So, so we're just having a coffee break there now, uh, Matthew. Yeah. Can you, can you hear me okay? Oh, you can. Great. Are you happy with the connection? Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. And just flick through a few slides there, Matthew, just to see. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we can see them. Yeah. That's it. That's perfect. Uh, so what we do, Matthew, is uh, Fidelma will introduce you, and then you can kick off. And then at the end, you might just relay one or two questions to you. Yeah, we don't think you will be able to hear them. They'll be asked from the they'll be a roving mic on the floor, but I might have to relay them to you. Hello, Matthew. Yeah. Jerry's here. What? Yes. I mean, we can. We can. Um, the slides will be part of, because of the recordings will yeah. be up on the website. If you have it on a slide, do you? Yeah. 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 Oh, and, and people are interested in takeaways as well from today, you know. They're, they're in an email. They're not on a like a PowerPoint slide that we can. They're PDFs, yeah. Because I suppose they, I think um, Geraldine would have emailed them around last year to anyone who was interested. I think that's the. Just got global yeah. sent.
I can hear you okay when we're up on the screen, hopefully. We're live. Now, thanks everybody. If we could maybe get going again in the interest of time. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks a million. <laughs> I feel like I'm calling last orders. <laughs> yeah. Now, thank you very much, everybody. Sorry. The holding session. Now, thanks for your attention, thank you. Um, we're delighted to um, introduce our next speaker, uh, Matthew O'Brien. Um, Matthew is a physiotherapist working in cancer services uh, down in University Hospital Limerick. And we're delighted to have him here today to talk about um, physical activity guidelines for people with multiple myeloma. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Now, Matthew is coming live to us actually from Limerick, so we should, so we be, should able be able to see, to see him up on our, our screen. Lovely, Matthew. Now you can take it away. Okay, um, thank you very much, Delna, and good evening, everyone. I hope you're really enjoying the day and getting a lot out of it. Um, mine will be short and sweet because I know it's getting to the end of the day and people are getting tired, um, but I'm wel I welcome any questions at the end. Um, so first of all, I want you just to think, uh, kind of the outline of today, we're going to talk about what is exercise, what does the evidence say, um, safety concerns around exercise with uh, multiple myeloma, the current exercise guidelines, kind of looking at some barriers to exercise and how we may address them and leaving time for a question at the end. So first of all, I want you all to think, are we currently sedentary, active or actively exercising? What is physical activity? What is exercise? So physical activity is any bodily movement that is produced by the skeletal muscle, which results in energy expenditure. And this is generally just anything we do in our day-to-day -day, um, activities. Exercise then is a subtype of, ex of physical activity that is planned, structured, and repetitive for the purposes of maintaining and improving fitness. And we would be strong advocates of both physical activity and exercise. There's a lot of evidence coming out that's saying someone who's going through the cancer journey and their treatments, the physiology can be very similar to um, the astronauts in, in space in terms of the effect on, on bone mass and, and muscle mass and things like that. So we will be strong advocates of physical activity and we'll explain that a little bit further as we go through. There are four types of exercise. There's cardiovascular exercise, strength flexibility and balance exercise and we want to be engaging in in, a, in, a, in each of these particular areas cardiovascular exercise is anything that uh, gets you moving and gets the heart rate up for a sustained period of time this can be walking dancing gardening uh, any activity that you enjoy and that you're going to persist with how often we're looking to do it three to five days a week and the general guidelines will be that we're trying to get 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise over the week so that would be five days a week at about 30 minutes and that can be broken down further into 10 minute blocks if we need to particularly around those chemo cycles 
the intensity that we're looking to work at is fairly light to somewhat hard. And what that translates to, translates to is that you'd be able to keep a conversation going with somebody while you're exercising, but you wouldn't be able to sing them a song. Okay. Um, again, as we said, it's 30 to 60 minutes um, over the course of the day. Again, fit five to 10 minutes here and there, or go for 20 to 30 minutes, depending on your abilities at this time. But again, we're just trying to get a little bit more active. During treatment, several short sessions may work better than one long one, but be active however you can. And obviously, if you're doing something you enjoy, that's going to be easier to adhere to. As I said, modern, modern intensity exercise can incorporate any of these. And again, something that you like is, is more preferable. So walking, gardening, hiking, dancing, cycling, active recreation, playing with your kids or grandkids, or swimming as well. And as I said already, the exercise intensity is somewhat hard. You should be able to keep a conversation going with someone, but not be able to sing them a song. A little hot, a little sweaty, a little out of breath. In terms of strength training then, Strength training is important for people with cancer because it builds muscle. Muscle tissue plays a big role in balance, in managing fatigue and in our quality of life, but it's also shown to improve how we process our chemo drugs. You don't have to be a, a bodybuilder, but it can make our activities of daily living a lot easier. And what we talk about resistance um, work, it can be hand weights, it can be resistance bands, it can be weight machines, or it can be using our own body um, body weight, for example, kitchen counter push-ups or chair squats or something like that, that increases the loads on, on the muscles to a point where they get tired. And by getting tired, they're going to build stronger and get, and, and get stronger for the next activities. We're looking at kind of a, a, a minimum of two sessions a week and start with light effort and build up medium to hard effort. And particularly with multiple myeloma, we want to start light and, and build gradually. We're looking at 10 to 15 repetitions of each muscle group, and we're looking at kind of um, building up to kind of eight to 12 at a challenging effort. So at about that 15, you should be getting tired and feeling that you're nearly not able to, to do another rep. And again, you will build up, build up slowly then with with resistance after that if you need if you need it get help from a certified exercise professional and they can teach you the right ways to move and how to breathe properly if we have lymphedema you may benefit from wearing compression sleeves during the strength training as well flexibility we're looking at kind of two to seven days a week holding a stretch for 10 to 30 seconds again your major muscle groups that can be your calves your quads your hamstrings um and the arms as well around the shoulders and things like that trying to fit in more steps into your into your overall day aiming for seven to nine thousand steps a day things that you enjoy to do you're going to uh, enjoy doing is going to be better adherence so dancing to your favorite songs trying yoga or tai chi playing with your kids or grandkids anything that makes you smile and that you're going to do a bit more often and balance as well is very important particularly with chemotherapies and the side effects with peripheral neuropathy we want to increase our balance to reduce the risk of falls and again to improve our quality of life so exercises that, like in this field may include standing on one foot walking on a line or using kind of a balance board or narrowing our base of support just to challenge us a little bit there's huge benefits of both aerobic and strength exercise in a lot of the side effects that, that we see with cancer. So aerobic exercise, the purple indicate things that have strong level of evidence and the blue would indicate things that have emerging evidence um, around them. So cancer related fatigue, health related quality of life, physical function, anxiety and depression have all had positive improvements with aerobic exercise and there's emerging evidence that it helps our sleep as well. In terms of strength, we've seen strong evidence in terms of cancer-related fatigue, health-related quality of life, our physical function, and managing lymphedema as well. There's also moderate evidence that it helps with our bone health and, again, helps with our sleep there as well. How does exercise do this? We're not fully sure, but the possibilities are that it reduces our overall levels of obesity, it reduces fat around the organs, it helps to balance the hormones within our body, it improves our immune system function, and it can reduce the, those potentially carcinogenic cells as well. And there's particularly very strong evidence around it reducing the risk of breast cancer, endometrial cancer, kidney cancers, bladder cancers, esophageal cancers, stomach and colon cancers. A 
Aside from multi having multiple myeloma, exercise plays a key role in the prevention and management of over 26 different chronic conditions, especially diabetes, heart, heart disease, depression, anxiety, blood pressure, cholesterol, and many, many more. And exercise really is that kind of one tablet that has a huge benefit on a lot of different chronic conditions. And we know that people can have other chronic conditions alongside their multiple myeloma. So why are physios so hung up on exercise? So what we tend to find is when people have a cancer diagnosis, this can be impaired health. It can lead to inactivity because you, the adage in, in particular in the 1990s was rest was best. So people become less active. They would kind of withdraw themselves from activities for fear of getting infections and things. Um, this led to altered body compositions, more fat, less muscle, an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and other health problems. This in turn le led to deconditioning and led to disability. What we're trying to do is counsel people and encourage them to get more active in whatever way they can. So increasing their physical act um, activity and optimizing their physical function. Again, because it both helps with the with managing and processing our, our cancer, but also managing and processing the chemo related to the cancer and um, therefore, therefore increasing people's quality of life. Disease and its treatment side effects. So um, we can, the side effects of cancer leads to muscle impairment, fatigue and deconditioning. Physical rehab and physical activity increase our functional capacity, reduce our fatigue and improve our quality of life. But safety must be considered when engaging in any physical activity programs. Exercise with multiple myeloma is generally safe and recommended. However, you should see your doctor before you start um, so they can assess your individual safety needs. Everyone is different. Exercises can be modified to suit your needs so that you can exercise safely regardless of what stage you're at. Avoid pools and public gyms if you've been told that you've low immunity or you're feeling unwell. Always listen to your body. Make sure that you're doing all the exercises um, that you feel stable doing to minimize the risk of falls. Wear good supportive shoes that are tied properly. Avoid slip-ons. Listen to your body. Some breathlessness is expected with activity, but it should be manageable. Avoid heavy weights. Always make sure the area is free of clutter to avoid any, any trips or slips. And stop immediately if you feel any new or increasing pain and let your doctor or nurse know. This infographic is going to be up on the on the website hopefully af afterwards, but we've identified certain kind of similar to a drug prescription. There's a minimally effective dose um, of exercise that can be very beneficial for whatever side effects you may be having. So taking, for example, a cancer related fatigue, which can be quite common. Um, what they found is the minimally effective dose for helping with cancer-related fatigue from an aerobic capacity would be three sessions a week of 30 minutes per session, again, at that moderate intensity exercise level, which would be that you're able to keep a conversation going with someone, but you wouldn't be able to sing them a song. If we're looking at resistance, that would be two sessions a week of two sets of 12 to 15 reps for the major muscle groups around the body. And again, looking where we're looking to fatigue around that 12 to 15 reps, or you can do a combination of the two. And again, this will be, will be posted up on the website for you to, to have a look at um, later as well. The ACSM guidelines for cancer survivors, from an aerobic point of view, we're looking at that 150 minutes of aerobic exercise over the course of the week. So that would be kind of 30 minutes, five days a week. But again, they said the minimum dosage we could have is kind of three sessions a week at 30 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity. And for strength training, we're looking at two sessions a week, uh, two sets of eight to 15 reps. And again, we're starting very, very light and just building up gradually as our body gets used to that. Considerations for lytic lesion. So obviously with multiple myeloma, there's that increase, um, there's that increased risk of, of fractures from lytic lesions. Exercise can can be safely done, but there are some precautions in place. So for example, if somebody had uh, 
lesions within their kind of proximal femur. They can work away with upper limb. They can work away with trunk exercises. But when it comes to their lower limb resistance exercises, they would just need to avoid hip flexion, hip extension. Um, but they could work away on aerobic bikes and walking and stuff like that, as provided they're pain free. Um, and they can work away with some gentle flexibility exercises. If there was lesions within the lumbar spine, then we'd be looking at um, safely working with uh, upper limb resistance, not working on trunk um, resistance exercises, and they could work on, on some lower limb exercises. Um, from uh, aerobic capacity, we're looking at kind of non weight bearing exercises, so our, our bike again would be safe there. And again, there's some guidelines around flexibility. And again, I know this has been recorded, so that will be available for you to, to see afterwards as well. Sedentary behavior. So sedentary behavior is any time that we're, we're not particularly active and there is no safe um, safe limit for this and what we would look at is kind of the activities we do during the day where we're sitting so sitting having our breakfast in the morning sitting traveling into into, into work or school um sitting while at work sitting when we come home doing our homework or, or doing those odd jobs um having our dinner sitting watching the tv in the evening um or playing on the phone um so we count up that time and that tells us kind of how much time we're spending sedentary there's no acceptable time that has been identified. The key is to keep active as much as possible and avoid prolonged periods of sitting down. And what they found is long periods of sedentary behavior can actually undermine, even if somebody is, is meeting their, their exercise guidelines, could undermine that as well. So it's just important to get active and, and do a bit through the day. Sitting is detrimental even to those who meet their physical activity recommendations, as I just said. Um, but we do appreciate that there can be some barriers to it as well. So key things are plan your day and spread out activities. Aim to get up between the ad breaks and get moving around, even if you do a, a job in the kitchen. Park a little further away from work, so you're encouraged to walk that little bit more. Take the stairs if possible um, and avoid the lifts. Um, do those jobs that you've been meaning to do around the house. Common barriers to exercise can be lack of time, travel, having to travel to a location, fear or lack of skill in that particular area. The weather is a common problem within Ireland. Um, social influence, so maybe not having a supportive social network around you or um, not feeling particularly, particularly confident to go and join groups around you. Having a lack of en energy is, is particularly common during chemo regimes, lack of knowledge, lack of motivation, social influence, family involvement. And again, hopefully on the website, we're going to have a little um, a little prompt sheet that if any of these are a particular issue, there are some, uh, some ways in how we can address them as well. So the take home message. All of you are different and may have different requirements, either because of multiple myeloma, the treatments you've had, the side effects of the treatments, and other non-cancer related issues such as diabetes, blood pressure. It's so important to get clearance to exercise from your doctors. Try to see a physiotherapist or a trainer who specializes in oncology as they will tailor your programs appropriately. And I thank you for listening and I welcome any questions. to the screen. Sorry, you're just on mute there, Della. Sorry. Can you hear us there now again? Yeah. Perfect. Yep, perfect. Any question for Matthew? So specifically after transplant. Causing problems that way. I don't know if you heard me. Could you hear that there, Matthew? So Sorry, any Emma. any particular timing post transplant that you could begin exercise or any particular issues around that? So I suppose the, in particular to transplants, we don't tend to see a lot of them come back to Limerick. So I would follow the guidance from the transplant centre that you get. Um, there seems to be a lot of strong evidence that 
engaging in physical activity post transplant can actually reduce the the number of possible blood transfusions that that may be required because again it increases our plasma volume and helps with, with that side of things as well um so i wouldn't i can come back to that particular individual around guidelines specifically after the stem cell transplants because they tend to be down the line um we don't see a lot of them coming back into limerick um so i can get some guidance on that and come back to the person okay, okay. perfect, perfect. Anything else? Any other questions? Just one more there. Sorry about that. Thanks. So, is there a register of physiotherapists who uh, who have a specialization in uh, advising patients with myeloma? So, within within the. I, the Irish Society of Chartered Physios, there's a special interest group called the Chartered Physios in Oncology. Um, so it would be linking in the ICP and you could get you could get their names through the register. Um, also any any physiotherapists who have done further training in cancer rehabilitation or um, I know the Pink and Steel programs that are out there as well, which again um, give you further there there are additional courses that you do following um, your degree in physiotherapy, and they would train you up in kind of what to look out for in terms of, of cancer and kind of how to how to manage the side effects and, and how to kind of adjust and modify treatment sessions as, as need be. So they would be two of the of the programs I, I know of around the country. Um, but again, the Irish Society of Physios have, um, have a register of physiotherapists that have a special interest in that area. And also on the Ask the Physio um website as well there's further guidelines on on cancer there so it's, uh, I, again the pain is running all the time as well thank you just one more there Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you for mentioning it. Um, the XWELL program, it would have started, I think, with cardiac rehab patients that they extended out to pulmonary rehab. And now in certain pockets, they're doing cancer rehab as well. Um, and again, as you said, they're medically supervised um, and they would be a very reliable source around the country to engage in as well, definitely. And also um, some of your cancer support centres as well would have, have programmes as well. But I, I, I want to kind of mention a, a particular point that you said there. The fact that you had been very fit going into your, your stem tra cell transplant and, and being a and gym buddy would only stand in your in your favour going into those, I, I, into getting your transplant. But even even having that, and this is a common thing as well, confidence is a big issue and, and having kind of a, a lack of, no, of knowledge or a, a, a kind of a fear of doing harm or not being able to engage safely in in therapies um so again there are some some kind of studies and programs that are going on at the moment um i know through james's who have kind of led the way with a lot of this stuff um they are working on kind of how to restratify patients and identify whether patients are safe for online exercise classes whether they need to attend class um exercise classes within their areas they're also trying to develop a database of what exercise classes are around the country as well um, so that we can safely sign, sign post patients because they've identified through their work with prehab, with kind of the rehab um, following um, different cancer surgeries and transplants, that there is that to get people built up, they get quicker kind of uh, shorter length of stay in hospital. <coughs> vision and guidance on what's safe to do, how far can I push myself, and what kind of risk factors should I be looking out for as well. Um, so that is 
that is in the process of, of coming out the line as well. And that, um, Dr. Ian McGuinan, um is is doing the, is doing that particular study up in Dublin at the moment. So there are further resources coming. Okay, thank, okay, you, very thank much, you very much, Matthew. Matthew. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. I think we'll leave it there. there. Thanks, Thanks very much. Very much. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so next, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Geraldine Daly. Who's double jobbing there, the mic. <laughs> and Geraldine. Geraldine is um, a hematology nurse specialist down in Limerick and has extensive experience working with patients with myeloma and in particular coordinating their um, uh, oh, yeah. transplant. Um, good evening everyone, I have the pleasure of presenting last. So <laughs> I just want to check who's had a transplant just and uh, who's waiting for a transplant? Oh great, okay so a lot of you, I could present this I'm sure at this stage. So now I'll just go with the right. Contents, so what are we going to look at? Oh, went a bit fast there. So what are we looking at? Just introduction. Uh, who is suitable for transplant? Uh, the, well, that should be actually steps of the autologous transplant, side effects of transplant and aftercare. Going the wrong way. So what is an autologous stem cell transplant? Well, the professors earlier on alluded to different names for it, but uh, for the sake of this, I'm just going to call it an, an autologous transplant. So it's not technically a transplant, because the recipient and donor are different persons, are the same person, sorry, are the same person. So it's not technically a transplant, it's just a means of giving high dose chemotherapy. And obviously the intent of the treatment is to provide prolonged remission from myeloma. So up to now patients would have received induction treatment, which is a low dose chemo, and it's given in cycles. So the low-dose chemo kills off the plasma cells but allows the good cells to recover. So this is totally different. It's a high-dose chemotherapy. It's probably maybe 10 times higher than what patients previously had. And you couldn't just give it because patients would be in hospital for long periods of time and may not even recover. So prior to the transplant, they have to harvest their stem cells and I'll talk about this later. Uh, this is to rescue the bone marrow. So I tell this stem cell transplant can provide significant remission that is both long and deep and extend survival. So patient related factors. So age is the first factor to consider. So usually it's recommended for patients under the age of 65 and but we have patients who've had this procedure up to the age of 70, who have good performance status, uh, which means they've good heart, good lungs, not too many comorbidities, and they can do extremely well. So it's an individualized treatment basis. So this is the famous stem cell. So this is the only cell in the body that can replicate into an identical cell, and also, depending on the body's needs, you know, can develop into white cells, red cells, and platelets. So this is step one. How is that coming up now? So this is, okay, step one. So the blood cells are only located in the bone marrow. So there's only 3% in the circulation. But to get these stem cells out of the bone marrow, uh, there's many ways. And the first way is, given GCSF are colony stimulating factors. And they, this triggers the release of bone marrow stem cells into the bloodstream. Then the peripheral blood stem cells are harvested and frozen for days, weeks, or years into the future. So the three main methods for stimulating the growth of blood cells are just with the GCSF alone, with a combination of chemotherapy called cyclophosphamide in myeloma and GCSF. And then if that doesn't work, they can give a mobilizing agent, 
with the growth factors. And that's just an infusion you get the night before. So this is the procedure. So to have the procedure done, it's like a washing machine. Um, you are attached to this machine, your blood is sucked out, it's spun, and the cells are creamed off. And it's to do with the specific gravity of the cell and the weight. So they know exactly what they're taking out and the remaining cells are reinfused. So you're never left with a deficit of blood cells. Now this procedure can take maybe up to six hours or a few days. And as a gentleman said earlier, he's took five days. So, you know, but that's extreme. So the side effects of harvesting the stem cells. So uh, the effect of apheresis are temporary and are caused by the exchange in the volume in the patient's blood circulating out of the apheresis machine, as well as blood thinners that are used to stop the blood clotting in the tubes. So the most common side effect experienced during apheresis are slight dizziness and tingling sensation in the hands and feet. And that's because the calcium sticks onto the tubing and reduces the calcium level in the blood. So less common side effects include chills, tremors, and muscle cramps. So this question is often asked, how do you know you're collecting enough cells to rescue the bone marrow? So there have been many studies done, we're not doing it in isolation, uh, to determine the number of stem cells you need. So the number is quantified by a laboratory technique called CD34 analysis. So a minimum number of stem cells to safely complete a transplant is 2 million CD34 cells per kilogram. Now that sounds like an awful lot, but they're minute cells. So usually when they do the stem cell harvest, they usually collect enough for two transplants and they store one, you know, for the future, should it be needed. So this is um, an image of the process and storage. So after collection, the peripheral blood is taken to the lab and frozen. It's called cryopreservation. The stem cells are mixed with a solution called DMSO, and this keeps the cells alive, you know, and then they're stored in liquid nitrogen. So they're frozen for as long as necessary. So often you could have the harvest, but your transplant part may not happen for maybe four to three months, four weeks to three months. So these can be frozen safely for that length of time. So there's an excellent function of stem cells retained for at least 10 years. So, and as I said already, there's enough stem cells collected for a second transplant. So preparing for transplant, um, prior to, uh, post harvest and prior to transplant, well, we're calling it a transplant, but it's high dose chemotherapy, you need to have pulmonary function tests to check your lung capacity, echo to check your heart function, ECG, chest x-ray, and dental assessment, because if you have any decay that you can't, you know, see or feel or, you know, prior to um, transplant, it might kick off during transplant and lead to complications and, you know, can be serious infection. A 24-hour urine for creatinine clearance is for the kidney, and you also need a line inserted. So it's either, depends, we utilise St. James's in Limerick and Galway. Uh, most of our patients go to St. James's for their transplant and we're grateful to have that service. But some go to Galway and in Galway they prefer a Hickman catheter, but in James's it's pick line. So a Hickman catheter is inserted under the skin into a central vein and the pick line is in the antecubital fossa, you know, in both arms. And there's also ports, but we don't use ports. So... After the harvest, cells are stored, that part is over, you're allowed home for a few weeks to recover, and then you are brought back either to Galway or St. James's in our case for the administration of high-dose chemotherapy. So the high-dose chemotherapy kills these cells inside the patient's body in, in the microenvironment, which they talked about earlier. So it cells even prior to the transplant, you will feel a great response from your standard chemo, but this high dose chemo gives you a much deeper response. And the drug of choice here is melphalan, and it's administered over two days. So it's like cruise missile, which we all know about these days, 
killing the cancer cells. And then post that, you get your stem cells that you have already saved or rescued. Um, so they're returned through the center line over 30 to 60 minutes. Now, uh, you may notice a strange taste or smell, but that's due to the preservative. So that disappears after a day or so. So when you walk into somebody's room who's had a tran uh, the transplant stem cells, you can actually smell this garlicky smell. It's really strong, but it disappears. So the day you receive the stem cell is known as day zero, and that's just so you can count forward and say, I've had my transplant you know, 10 days ago, 21 days ago, up to 100 days. So from the bloodstream, the stem cells through the central line, if you give them to a peripheral line, they'd stick to the veins and would be ineffective. So you need a central line. So they grow and develop into red cells, white cells, and platelets. The stem cells embed and migrate to the bone marrow and they embed in the tissue there. Like, it's amazing. I don't know how they do it, but that's, how, <laughs> that's exactly what happens. And this is often called engraftment. So after 10 to 21 days, your blood counts start to recover. So this lady rescuing this man here, well, you know, it's a different kind of rescue, but stem cells do rescue the bone marrow, otherwise you'd be hospitalized and very ill and may never recover. So what happens when you're in hospital, you've had your high dose chemo, you've had your stem cells to rescue the bone marrow, and then for a period of time, the stem cells begin to grow in the bone marrow. So during that period, your blood counts are really low, you're at an increased risk of infection, bleeding because of the low platelets, anemia because of the low hemoglobin, and most people end up getting an infection. But you're in hospital and they can treat it pretty quickly. You may not even have a white cell count or a neutral count for a short period of time. So you know, that's why you need to be in a protected environment. Nausea or sickness is a problem, but we're very strong anti-sickness now, so when you do get the stem cells, just retracting, uh, the stem cells, you can feel nauseated as well during that period, but they give you strong anti-emetics then as well. So a sore mouth, mucositis, gastritis, you know, because the cells, the chemotherapy kills any cells that divide rapidly, especially in the GI tract. So um, sore mouth is really common. And everything is, you're given prophylactic treatment to prevent it. But if it does happen, you know, you can have a lot of pain and you can get opiates. And that's normal, you know, during that period. So loss of appetite, loss of weight, that happens as well. Because obviously you don't feel like eating, but it's for a very short period, you know, and recovery it does happen. You bruise easily because your platelets are low, uh, but you're in bed, you know, for a long period of time. So you know, that shouldn't be a problem. And they can reinfuse platelets because they check your bloods every day. Indigestion as well. Now, reduce concentration. You can get a chemo brain. And when you're fatigued and your counts are low, you know, it's normal not to feel 100%. As well as that, you lose your hair with the high dose treatment. Uh, but it does grow back. And it doesn't fall out for three weeks. You know, but then once the procedure is over, it starts growing again. So some of the side effects start to get better within a few weeks of your transplant. Others can last for much longer, such as fatigue. You know, um, like some of the patients would say, gosh, you were so fatigued, I never realized it was going to be so difficult. But a week later, you meet them and they're fine. So it can, they can recover very quickly. Preventing infection. Until engraftment of the stem cells take place, the body's immune system is weakened by the effects of the high dose chemotherapy and patients are very susceptible to develop infections. Like even a minor infection, like a common cold, can lead to serious problems. So special precautions are necessary during recovery. So, you know, obviously when you're in hospital, it's a very safe place and you're monitored really closely, you know, um, until you're discharged. So, you know, they have antibiotics on hand. Visitors, you know, during COVID, uh, I mean, in, in some cases, there was no visitors allowed, but now they're coming back and but they've been, there were mask gowns and gloves, you know. You should avoid vegetables and fruits because they carry bacteria and obviously flowers are prohibited. 
Um, so patients and their caregivers are given instructions for maintaining a safe environment at home to help prevent infection while the immune system continues to recovery. So for three months after the transplant, your immunity is low and you have to be pretty cautious. Um, and because you're, as the professor said earlier, you know, COVID as well being a big problem now, you have to get revaccinated after three months. So high dose chemotherapy with stem cell rescue can place physical, psychological, emotional and financial stresses on patients and their family. So, you know, patients can feel angry, depressed and anxiety, and so can carers, you know, um, or their partners or their family. Uh, because, you know, the future is unknown and because myeloma is not treat curative at the moment, but very treatable, and I'm sure in time it will be curative. You know, there's lots of support out there, like the support groups, you know, um, you know, there's psychologists, we have psychologists in counselling, and some patients even need psychiatric help, which is absolutely normal. So, um, but it does help. So there's lots of, you know, uh, opportunity to pick up on this. So post-transplant then, um, after the 100 days, they assess you by doing a bone marrow and CT skeletal survey, and they check your proteins, the light chains, and this, you know, even though this is an indicator how you've done after transplant, the transplant can continue to work for up to a year. So consultation is often given now, after the 100 days, to enhance the impact of the transplant. And it's usually given like two or four cycles. Um, like, just like the induction treatment that you had, or the low dose that you had prior to transplant. And this, uh, you know, consolidates and gives you a deeper response. And I've seen that, you know, patients can post-transplant have still got a protein or would have a partial response and with consolidation can go into remission. So post-transplant, now you have, I've put this picture up, it doesn't mean you'll be playing golf or walking the dog or baking a cake or playing music, but you know, life gets back to normal, you know, um, as much as possible. So um, that's a very short <laughs> synopsis of transplants. So if there's any questions. Now, any questions there for Geraldine? Yeah. Or comments? Hello. Yeah, Hello. the purpose of transplant is to kill the bad cells then when you now put back your stem that has been collected, it will now start growing better once we come. The stem cells are the original cell. When, when you have myeloma, you have the stem cell, which divides into white cells, red cells, and platelets. Then there's a malfunction in the white cells as the cell matures. So the stem cells haven't that malfunction. So the stem cells are only to rescue the bone marrow because the high-dose chemotherapy is the treatment to kill any uh, residual cells. So the, if you just said the high-dose treatment, high treatment in its own, you might never leave hospital because you'd have no white cells. All the stem cells would be destroyed because that's what happens. You know, the high-dose chemotherapy kills the stem cells as well. So that's why you have to rescue some of your own stem cells, but your stem cells are healthy stem cells. It's only when they mature onto plasma cells that there is a malfunction in the production line. So it's the high dose chemotherapy that kills, kills off any remaining cells there, myeloma cells, you know, and in, in, in the microenvironment. Does that make sense? If, if the um, chemotherapy kills the cells, everything is gone, why will it come back again? Can they come back again? Yeah. They can, because it's not a cure, high dose chemotherapy. It don't gives you prolonged, deeper remission, but it's not a cure back again. Can somebody redo it? You can. We've had patients who've had two transplants and when they harvest stem cells or, you know, initially, they harvest enough for two transplants. So you, your second portion of stem cells that were harvested can stay frozen for up to 10 years. Yeah. Like we've had patients who've had one stem cell transplant 
like 15 years ago are still in remission. So every individual is different, you know, and it's not just the proteins, as I said earlier on, it's the microenvironment, it's uh, individual based, you know, it's the response is individual based, you know, so uh, that's why we keep a close eye on patients in the long run every three months and check their proteins and the light chains and everything just so we can pick up any change, you know, and treat it. So you're wondering why you're going for this procedure if it's going to come back again. But if you didn't have it, like it's the gold standard, not just here in Ireland, but in Europe. So it's still, as I said earlier, the best treatment for those who can have it under the age of 65 or 70. Okay. Thank you. Just in relation to um, after their stem cell transplants, does everybody get consolidation treatment afterwards or is it just based on the Now, if you're in total remission, you know, um, sometimes they just put you on maintenance. Okay. But if you've a, a paraprotein, a, a very good partial response, is what they call it, they would certainly give you consolidation. Yes. And some places, it's individual based. You know, you, you get an input into our, you know, the patient does. You know, in some hospitals, they would automatically do it. Others did, you know, say, well, look at your remission. You could be in remission for a long time. Sure. We can save it, keep an eye on your proteins. You know, and it's the same with maintenance. Yeah, I had heard that there was, you know, uh, maintenance afterwards, but I didn't realise there was consolidation the same as before yes. you went in. Well, so that's the, the latest, your know, best practice. All right. Okay. Now, it's constantly changing. Sure. You know, in six months' time, it could be totally different. Right. And we might have CAR T cells. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. And just the tiredness after yes. a stem cell yes. transplant. Yes. How long does it go on for, or now when does it ease? Okay, that's individual. You know, they say three months, give yourself three months post like a hundred, day 100, right, to, to recover. You know, some people recover sooner, some people it takes longer. And if you have comorbidities, you know, it's a little bit slower. Like I have had patients say, oh my God, I just can't get out of bed. And then next week they're saying, oh my God, I feel great. So, you know, it can happen spontaneously like that. But, you know, give yourself three months, you know, to get back to your oh, bacon and got... Day, um, huh? Tuesday I was in debate. Again, yeah. yeah. And how yeah. long since you've had it, your transplant? Yeah, about five weeks. Oh, that's ah, very yeah. early. My goodness, you're trying to run before you walk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, slowly, slowly. And listen to your body. Do you know, not your head. You feel you can do more, but... If your body tells you you're tired, you know, you should rest, yeah. So thank you. So I quickly just want to finish up. That's the end of all the talks you'd be glad to hear. I um, just want to thank you all so much for coming. Um, it's brilliant. We've had a great attendance. Um, we actually had to close the registration. It was such interest, which is brilliant. And I hope you all got something from it. If you want to contact any of us, just contact us through the website or through Facebook or Twitter. And we're very happy to take questions. We will be sending out um, an evaluation form by email. And we'd really appreciate if you could fill that out and send it back to us. Or if there's any topics you'd like covered at the next meeting, um, just let us know and we'll, we'll try our best to get a speaker. I want to thank today's speakers. Um, they were all just brilliant. I really want to thank um, Ali and John who you know spoke from the heart and that's not always easy. You know, it's not always easy to tell your own story. So we really appreciate that. Um, and sorry, oh, I've done it again. Just the committee. Um, so I want to thank Maura Dowling, who was the chair last year. I took over from Maura, um, and she did huge work um, in the run-up to this before I took over. And another person who left the board, Siobhan Callagher, who was a really great help to us from Board Match, um, who helped us with our rebranding and merchandising and gave us great advice. Sinead, Cassidy, and Mark, um, just we, we couldn't have done today without them, and they always keep us on the straight and narrow. I want to thank the hotel. Um, I want to thank Brian Fogarty who manages our website and um, you know puts everything up on the website for us. Um, Neve, um, 
is here, our board member who managed the Twitter page. Um, I'm always sending her stuff and wrecking her head, so thank you, Neve. Um, and thanks to John O'Mahony, who launched, I think he might be gone, he launched our cycle today um, and took photos and did an interview for the media, so that hopefully will raise more awareness around my Loma when that hopefully hits the papers, maybe this weekend. Um, and to the board members, um, we've all been working really hard in the background to pull today off and with the cycle and everything, so just really appreciate everyone's hard work. There's patients, there's um, healthcare professionals, there's, um, I'm not going to use the word care ever again, uh, partners. <laughs> so um, yeah, so thank you everybody for all your hard work and safe home and we'll see you all. We'll see the energetic people in Limerick for the cycle and the rest of you will see you next year at the Patient Day. Thank you very much.